Hello and welcome to Skander Knits. My name is Ellie and I am a Norwegian living and knitting in London. And you can find me on Instagram as Skander, as a designer on Ravelry called Skander Knits and uh, of course my Ravelry group Skander Knits. And uh, yeah, that's the best place to take part in the knit alongs and the Skander Knits community, getting pattern support and getting in touch and all that stuff so yeah welcome to my knitting podcast aka knitting talk show me blabbering about knitting for about an hour once a week or so um so yeah if you're new to this this whole experience that is essentially what i do and if you are a returning viewer then welcome back it's so good to have you back and welcome to everyone I did not think I would have time to record this week. I have a bit of a busy, busy one. There are uh, two concerts happening this week, one today and one tomorrow, but I figured I can squeeze in a bit of a recording right now and uh, I don't know, maybe I can edit on Friday or something. I, yeah, so it, it will be a thing. But yeah, I will go through the knit alongs I am running and then I'm going to show you some of the things that I have finished and some of the things that I am knitting on. So yes, I am running two knit alongs currently. I am running the year long knit along of 2019, which is where we aim to make six pairs of color work mittens for the duration of 2019. And more rules about that in the knit along thread, uh, which is linked below. Also, I did actually, uh, I think it was in the last episode or possibly the one before that, talk about what knit alongs are and how you join them and such. I think it was a decent explanation. Uh, yeah, it's in the beginning of the video, so if it's not the last video, then it will be the one before and you wouldn't be wasting much time looking for that content. So, yeah. Uh, the other knit along I am running is the Kuzikofte cow. This is Kuzikofte. Uh, it's actually been put away for the summer. We had a heat wave this Easter. It was terrible. I don't like anything about 20 degrees outside. I'm not here for it. So I put my beloved Kosakofta away for the winter, but I've taken it out just to show you what we are making for this knit along. Because about this time last year, I actually cast this thing on and worked on it over the summer without telling any of you. And this time you'll be doing the same, except you will be telling me because we have a, a knit along for it. So if you want to join in on that, this is. This is the thing that we are making. Whoa! <laughs> it's big, it doesn't fit into the frame. It's big, it's heavy, it's awesome. I love this thing, it's my coat. It still needs buttons. I have the buttons, they're in my notions bag. Have I put them on? No, I've actually taken two off. Oh, why I do this? Oh. So yeah, that was a pretty quick coverage of the knit along, so it doesn't usually Take me that little time. So I guess that means we can jump straight into what I have finished. And you are looking at one of them. Yes, indeed. I have finished Polworth. Yeah. Can we get some light on this? So my camera gets darker when I show darker items, which makes no sense. I'm going to do a bit of a, a booby close up. Yeah, that's better. See, that's better. Ooh. There is a problem. We all know the problem. It's been an issue since I cast it on and that is the floppy neckline. It's so floppy. There's no, nothing holding this thing up. There's no structure. The thing kind of just hangs from this neckline. <laughs> Sorry to start off with the negatives, but uh, this is the thing that I knew was a problem from the beginning. It's a brioche rib and brioche doesn't do rib. Like it doesn't do the contracting thing. It, it seems like other people who have made this have not had any problems with it, but I certainly have, and it seems difficult to fix. Why? One, it goes seamlessly into the brioche triangle in the front here, which is this beautiful detail. Hopefully that is light enough. So it needs to go seamlessly in. So I would need to know how to graft in brioche in order to make a new one that is tighter and fit that onto here and rip off the old one. That would be one part of the challenge. The other thing is I would have to sort of circumvent the issue of having worked lots of lots of short rows after working in the round before working the front triangle. This is not an easy feat. This is not as easy as you would think to replace. Oh. What I'm almost tempted to do is to pick up for a regular rib around here and just ignore the fact that it's not going to fit into the brioche, the triangle, knit that rib and fold that around the current brioche and have it a folded neckline that's just extra thick. That would pull together, that should do the job. 
Other things I could do is crochet a line along the inside that will just tighten it up. But still, it will flare, like that issue will still be there. I could do um, that crochet chain on the inside to tighten it up and then sew in elastic so it will pull together. I think that's a pretty good working plan. But it's not great because the rest of this thing is amazing. It, oh, I love this. I love the yarn. I love the pattern. I love the fit. It's a shame that just like this teeny little thing in the beginning has made the whole thing kind of just not work. <sighs> so let's talk about all the good things. First, we can start with the yarn. I have used Steinfine Wool, which is a little grey sheep yarn. It's a breed that they themselves have bred. They have it on their farm. They shear the sheep. They get it spun into yarn by John Arben and then they dye it. And they dye it in this amazing colourway that is the best shade of burgundy that I could think of. It's quite dark, but it's not too red, not too blue, not too purple, not too brown. It's just the right shade of burgundy. Quite hard to get across on camera, but I think it's kind of going okay. And oh... It feels so good to wear. Not as soft as I thought, but still pretty soft. Like, I'm not itchy. I love this. Oh, it's so warm. And it's just like, oh, it's a hug to the sleeves, to the arms. It's hug The sleeves are hugged to the arm. Yeah. And the sleeves are a bit long. I find... I oh, was just segueing straight into the, the, the pattern now. I find the yoke to be quite deep. I don't know why, but it's like hanging quite low here. This is my underarm. It's here. Because there's all this extra. I wonder if it could be due to the neckline. But even when I like push it up. There's still a bit of a excess. So if I pull up the sleeves it's fine. But then there's all this excess around here. Maybe I'm just not broad shouldered enough for the pattern. And that's a possibility. Uh, I, I think my shoulders are quite medium. So if I pull up the sleeves to be under the arm. There is so much excess up here now. See that? Yeah. So I don't know what exactly happened. I have a suspicion that maybe what I should have done is actually choose... It wouldn't have gone according to the size choosing uh, instructions, but if I had chosen a much smaller size that fits my shoulders, I could have then used bust darts later, which is included in the pattern, um, to make it fit the rest of me. I could have even increased below the bust, I could have. But I really do like the waist fit. It, it sits really well on me. It's got a lot of ease, but it still has that nice soft flare out from the waist. I did exaggerate, exaggerate that a little bit relative to instructions. There's slightly more decreases and increases than it's called for. But that made it very flattering indeed. And the brioche at the bottom actually, I'm just, oh, there's no room for me to stand. Ah, so I'm standing on my toes now, hopefully you can see this. The brioche, did actually work out really well for the body. I didn't think it would, but it did. Yay! It was flaring up and it was looking really odd as I was knitting on it, but after a soak and dry, it actually worked out really well. So there. I am really pleased with it, but the bit that I was looking forward to the most, which was the yoke, is the thing that is working out the least. This is the first time I'm actually wearing it, so I don't know how this is going to impact on how much I wear it for the future. Just, yeah, there's just too much going on up here. Um, it's too deep, it's too loose in the neckline, which is totally my fault. Um, eh. There seems very... It gets really frustrating when there's very little that I can do about these things. I usually like to know that I have fixes for... The, for things, but there's it's very little to be done. I don't mind the deep yoke, to be honest. It's a little bit restricting, like there's a lot of excess. Um, gosh, I got nothing else to uh, expand on that. It's just, yeah, not the super fit that I had looked forward to, uh, which is just because, um, you know, all bodies are different. I think it's something I'm gonna talk about a bit more at the end of the episode, because I've, I had a lot of thoughts about these things, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go there soon. Uh, but yeah, anyway, it's the Polworth sweater. It's an amazingly clear and precise pattern as ever by Isola Teague. Uh, her patterns are always great, and um, albeit not maybe the best fit for my torso. But yeah, I wonder. I have thought about this a lot. If my 
shoulder width is very narrow for the rest of my measurement relative to you know usual size measurements which is what patterns usually go by um it's just something i have suspected for a while that people assume that someone with my bust and hip measurements would have broader shoulders and maybe also a bit more depth between here i don't i don't know <sighs> anyway um i'll see if i can find some solutions for for the yoke try to gather it up a bit more up here um because if i do i think the rest of it will be totally fine it just needs that bit more structure up at the neckline to sit a bit better i think yeah because i have seen other people knit this and they fit really well it seems to be a bit of a a me issue a thing that only i have run into so um I hope I, I hope I can find some workarounds and also like if you have any actual um, informed suggestions please do let me know but I do ask you please only come with suggestions if you actually know what to do about this issue because often I get a ton of well-meaning advice and they are super like I said well-meaning and I, I don't want to sound ungrateful I need to know that you actually uh, base the advice on knowledge and experience uh, so I hope that doesn't sound too you know you know what I mean you guys know what I mean yeah. anyway so that is Paul Worth by Isolde Teague which makes me so happy that I finished it because I used uh, when I was in Edinburgh for the Yarn Festival last time I stayed at, in Paul Worth in the area of Paul Worth uh, so it's just kind of you know it's nice I do have another finished object as well. Yes, I've been very productive today. Today, um, this Easter, I sat on my bum and decided to get stuff off the needles. And I got two things off the needles. So that's not too shabby. And yeah, oh, this is, hang on. It's a mess, that's what it is. Ta -da! Again, too big to fit into the frame. What can I say? I love a big shawl. So, this is Vinter Schale. It's my second Vinter Schale. And let's do a comparison, shall we, before I get into the actual details that you probably want to know. This is my first Vinter Schale. I wear this thing so much. So I basically decided to make a second one. So this is the first one. You will have seen this a lot of times, especially if you know me in real life, you'll run into me sometime. Uh, you will know that this is my go-to shawl. It is made in Brooklyn Tweed Loft, which is a amazingly soft yarn and it has a lot of hold in it. So if you wear the shawl and you just kind of throw it on, it doesn't come off unless the wind is blowing. It's not as silky, slippery as a lot of superwash yarns that a lot of people find skin friendly to have around the neck. It just has a grip, but it's still soft and I just... Oh, I love this shawl so much. It's just one of the best things I've made. And I did actually make it as a, a test knitter for this about two years ago so there we have it i just love it so what i have made is the second one because i wear that thing so much and while it goes with like 90 percent of my burgundy and black wardrobe it doesn't go with all of it so um i made a second one with more autumnal colors and as you can see there is something looking a bit different it, it could be because i have just blocked this which basically means i soaked it and let it dry by hanging over the shower curtain rail uh but i mean hello you can see me through here and you can't with the other one and that is weird because i have used the exact same needle size and the exact same yarn and the exact same pattern and i have not found that my tension has changed for any other thing i have knitted since i made that other shawl two years ago How? What? I, I don't understand. Has loft changed? Was loft thicker before? I mean, this is... It could also be that this is the effect of this having been worn so much that it's just kind of contracted more and filled in more. Um, and maybe I'm just making stuff up. I don't know. I worn this a lot and I remember when I took the photos, it had been blocked stretched a lot deeper. It was a lot deeper at the time. And now it's looking a lot more like a scarf with a bit of depth. Uh, whereas this thing definitely has more shawl proportions. It's a lot, there's a lot of depth here. But it's see-through and I don't, I don't know. I used to complain a lot um, two years ago that my row gauge was very shallow. Like I could never get 
not shallow, it's the other way around, I don't know. I can never get raw gauge, I always needed more rows to make the same measurement. But I've not found that I have that problem lately, so maybe that is the thing that's just like fixed itself magically. Maybe I like have been listened to by the yarn gods or something, I don't know. So this is how you wear the second vintage shawl. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So as you will, may have noticed, I pushed the camera for other ways so we can actually see the whole thing in the frame. This was my bedroom. Awkward, but yeah, sure. I love it. Not my usual color scheme. I don't. I love a good autumnal um, aesthetic color scheme thing, but it's not something I use a lot. And I think this is going to go with a good portion of my wardrobe. I mean, I'm thinking like the Miss Rachel's cardigan. I that was kind of what spurred the making of this because. That cardigan and my other vintage shawl just don't quite go together and I do often wear my Vertices Unite with that cardigan because that's more of a tumnal palette as well but uh, it is more of the slippery superwash yarns and this is a little bit more me so yeah I am pretty pleased with this. I do really like this pattern, I love the shape of this shawl. It's mostly very simple garter or simple texture, like I think this is like a double moss stitch or something. And the one up here is a slightly different thing. Why is it see-through? Sorry, I was just shouting into the camera. Why is it, <laughs> Why is it see-through though? Oh, it'll be fine. It doesn't matter when I wear it in the end, you know, it, it's, it's lovely. I should pull my hair out. Yeah. I actually really like it with burgundy even. It goes really well with the sweater. It's got a pretty good autumn colour scheme happening. Yes, I am completely in denial of the fact that summer is happening, that we've had well into the 20s in centigrade temperatures this Easter. All the windows open, barbecues in the terrace, socialing, socialing, socialising. People in my home who don't live here. Who I didn't invite. Flat cheers. Oh. Anyway, you probably came here to be cheered up. So, uh, yes, shawl, sweater, done, happy, yay. <sighs> and yeah, super wearable, as wearable as the other one. It is bigger. I did deliberately try to make it bigger beyond just the loose gauge issue. But, uh, so yeah, I tried to use up more of the, the main colour, which is Pumpernickel by Loft by Brooklyn Tweed Loft. Um, so I've used up more, so there was a lot less left after I'd worked the eye card. A bit of a gamble, but I just remembered how much I had left of the light gray after I'd made this. So I was like, you know what, if I can make the shawl bigger, we all will be better off for it. And because this was not a test net, I had the liberty to do so, whereas for the other one, obviously, you stick to the pattern. So, so hey, not too shabby, a shawl and a sweater. Pretty big things. It smelled like a barn in here when I was soaking and drying these things, which is my revenge for the involuntary barbecue fests happening in two days in a row. And returning to works in progress, some items that I worked on last week, one of which was Aprosite, I think, uh, by Kiyomi Bergen. Name pronunciation, never my forte. Remember I'm foreign, go gentle on me. Sorry, I can't pronounce things. So I got the sleeves down. They were nearly done last time, so this is not particularly revolutionary. They're done. Woo! They're nice and done, and yes, they look rather short, but because this is a drop sleeve shoulder, drop shoulder sleeve design, uh, it doesn't require very long sleeves, really, because it's going to be a lot of dropping down here. That's kind of how they work. But we do have the body in this project bag. And it's nearly done, and there's really no excuse for why I just didn't finish it this week, apart from finishing other things. Uh, but I could have worked on this last night. But last night I kind of lost my mojo, which I will get back to, but yeah. This is the body, this is how far I've come. So I have serious fears that I'm going to run out of yarn for this, that I, I know I have a little bit less yarn than recommended in the pattern, but that should just mean that I can make it a little bit shorter, which is usually what I like anyway. But it doesn't seem like even that is enough. So I uh, wonder if maybe the yarn estimates in there aren't 
quite right or maybe it's just me it could be just me this is always an important factor if something isn't working out with your knitting blame yourself first <laughs> terrible advice from the skein and its podcast anyway but i think it's a good thing i jokes aside i think it can be good to like look into potential things that I could have done in the project that I am knitting on for myself instead of assuming it's a pattern because that is usually how you learn whether you're right or wrong uh, that's how you improve for the next item that you knit so that's my knitting philosophy for what it's worth so yeah I did split to the front and back a lot earlier than the pattern would have said that the armor would begin it is made flat so it doesn't really say to split anywhere but yeah so chances are I will be grafting some of the underarm together again I just better safe than sorry there um, so if I find that the armholes are well deeper than the oh wait longer in the opening than the pattern says then uh, I'll just graft that together and have a longer body so it's just for precautions sake so yeah uh, I need to decide which is going to be the front and back soon so that the, the front can be a bit lower for the, the neckline is coming up soon I think and uh, this is not all the yarn I have left there is also there's a bit of this this is this is the yarn I have left to do the neckline oh dear oh dear oh, and there's no way I could get more of this yarn there's no way there's uh yeah it'll be fine I like crop tops I'm not gonna complain um but yeah I'm using skein queens yarn sonsi i think it's called uh it's a lovely dk yarn with some i think it's polworth and Corma. don't quote me on that it's on ravelry <laughs> and uh i really love the yarn it's amazing and i'm holding it double with silk mohair from ainsworth and it, it, it's just becoming the best color in the world i mean second off for this jumper obviously um what can i say i i know what i like uh so it's coming along I just need to not avoid the whole yarn chicken scenario and just do the best that I can and if I can't do the full rib neckline as the pattern suggests I think that's fine it's a very snug neckline as opposed to this one uh, so I, I can definitely do that a bit shorter and just have a regular one I've seen projects on Ravelry that do that and I like them so that's it's quite likely that I'm going to do that and that will require less yarn and everyone will be happier for it especially me that is how our April site is going currently. I hope to have it done next time I see you guys, but I am making no promises because I am going to a concert, like I said, today and tomorrow. Uh, on Saturday is Love Your Yarn Shop Day. So really the only days I have off is Friday and Sunday and I should probably spend those days catching up with PhD work. So in the next segment of Ellie stresses out about her PhD thesis, another project I have cast on since last time. Um, this is another pattern from Lane magazine, which I actually have laying right here, so that's convenient. This is the item I just talked about, the April site, which I decided it's pronounced. <sighs> Finally found it. Here it is. Colour. I'm gonna call it that. No idea again how to pronounce things. People like to name their patterns things that are hard to pronounce, myself included, so I don't get to complain more photos of the shawl it is made to use the new stephen west yarn i think west wool there's an advert for it in here yes here's an here's the advert for the new yarn i've talked about the yarn before because i have color samples of it um and i really like the yarn but i happen to have four skeins of john Arben viola dk which i have sat on for a long time not literally sat on but you know i've had it since my first edinburgh yarn festival so that was back in 2017 it's two years ago i've had this yarn and not knitted with it the plan was to make the sofa cardigan by jennifer wood pretty much copying what katie of inside number 23 did um but uh, I think my size may have gone up slightly and I think I would like longer sleeves so it wouldn't be enough yarn but also it's Falkland Merino and Falkland Merino pills so much so I'd rather put that super soft yarn into a amazing shawl. So that is what I'm doing and the colour I mean you would actually I would I could forgive you for not actually seeing the item now because it's completely blending into my sweater like I generally on the, the little kind of um, video frame thing on my camera all I can see is the needles I actually can't see the shawl <laughs> 
It is pretty much the exact same color. Look at that. Can I wear these together? Is that a bad thing? I mean, you can't say they don't match. I mean, I know what I like. Again, I mean, I'm, I'm the burgundy cliche. Um, this is why you come here, right? So, uh, I seem to have finished mid-row. I haven't even worked. Oh, I'm almost at the end of the row. Why couldn't I just have finished? So, whew. Ah, well, pattern. I love it. Oh my god. I did see the shawl in person at Edinburgh Yarn Festival, which seems to be the general story behind why I feel like knitting all the Lane magazine things, because I'm knitting this second item from this magazine, and I'm already looking at a third one, because I tried this on at Edinburgh as well, and they have the yarn in my local yarn shop, Knit With Attitude, in London. I mean, yeah, it fit me really well. I like it. It's quite outside of my usual but it's kind of Bullhus inspired and it's all good. So yeah, returning to the item I was going to talk about. It starts off and it's primarily composed of broken rib and I love broken rib. I don't know what it is. I just love it. The fact that every right side row is a knit row and the wrong side is a, a rib row. It's just enough variation for me to keep going. And I usually hate purling, but this is like, there's enough breaks in that to make me just go yeah, yeah so it's grown really quickly so far i haven't quite used up the first of the four skeins but getting there and i have started cabling so that is what you see happening currently um so there cables are happening i love the cable pattern in this it's quite an unusual look so uh yeah looking forward to have this shawl not to compete with my lovely friends, the winter shawls, but you know, gotta, gotta have more shawls. Especially because the vast majority of my shawls are quite slick and slippery superwash shawls, which I am totally planning to make more of. Uh, I do like to have the more woolier ones as well. So this, it's gonna be a nice thing in, the, in between because it's a very soft merino, but it isn't superwash and it is quite fluffy. So yeah. You just can't go wrong with Falkland Merino for shawls because it, it doesn't get that much wear so it's less likely to pill but oh my days it's soft and warm. And you get to knit with Falkland Merino whilst avoiding the pilling so everyone's happy again. Yay. I do have a little bit of a complaint. I, I thought it was just me first because when I was knitting, which I'm still working on, the Soda cardigan from the previous issue of Lane, which has a lot of cables on and it's amazing and I love it, I couldn't tell the difference between a 2x2 two two cable or a 3x2 cable or a 2x3 cable. They all pretty much look the same. They. The symbols look identical when I look into the magazine. I can't tell one from the other. And most of the time this happened with the cardigan, it happened with the shawl, I get the first attempt wrong and I'm realizing once I'm a couple of rows down and I see that was not the kind of cable that they meant. But it's not that clear, because like I said, the three by two and two by three cables look the same as the two by two cable symbol. There's the symbols in the chart. Uh, I I wonder if it's down to like a software thing that they've used for both and all cable patterns because my suggestion would just be to use symbols that look different. There there are symbols that make sure that the the two parallel lines that are supposed to symbolize the three stitch part of the cable is thicker than the one that symbolizes the two stitch part of the cable when you do a two by three or three by two cable. Uh, that would be grand if they could do that for future prints of cable patterns. Uh, that would make life so much easier because right now there's been so many times where I have mixed up the two by three and three by two because they look the same, which can really alter the appearance of the project. And it did here, it looked like a mess. I had to do it all over again, which was fine because it was so early on, but it's not great. So yeah, that's my, um, my suggestion to Lane. So anyway, I love this shawl. I'm really enjoying the knit. I am so excited about what it's going to look like. Whilst I would have loved to make it in the new West Wall because that was amazing and I've seen it in um, Edinburgh Yarn Festival. I am really pleased that I'm going with this yarn, with this old stash 
well, old. It's it's two years old. The relative in my stash that's old. So it's it's really good to get through all of that as well. I have been fairly good at knitting from stash lately. Um, it's not an explicit goal of mine. It's just like. I have all this yarn that is a completely sensible thing to do instead of just acquiring more stuff so that is why there are no acquisitions for this episode either just like last week's i'm pretty pleased with that um that's not to say that i've failed if i end up buying a skein next week you know probably will because it's going to be on shop day but i uh yeah i'm loving my stash it's the love your stash day every day <laughs> i'm terrible i'm so sorry and yeah, this project actually lives in a bag that I have not used yet. I was so fortunate to win this bag that is made from these people. Gammelt knit from Lillehammer. Lillehammer is a small town in Norway that was mostly made famous from hosting the Winter Olympics and the Lillehammer TV show on Netflix. I actually used to live near Lillehammer for a year. I lived in the small village of, it's actually a town, Muarv. Don't ask me what I was doing there, but it was so boring it made me knit. Sorry if I offended anyone in the area. But it was really nice to live in basically in the middle of the triangle between Lillehammer, Jövik and Hamar. So that was pretty good. These are all kind of nice town-sized cities in Norway. And yeah, Lillehammer is beautiful. Absolutely love that place. And I had been there lots of times before in my younger days because my grandparents used to have a cabin further north in this little place called Fåvang. They had this on uh, an island in the river. We had to take a boat to get out there. There was no electricity, very little water. You had to go to the outhouse to do your... But yeah, anyway, that was a digression. I just love having this bag from Lillehammer. It's made in true vintage fabric. My guess is that these may have been some proper sturdy curtains back in the day. Um, I don't know if you can actually get hold of these bags, but what I do know is that midwinter yarns make uh, vintage fabric-based bags. So that could be worth looking into. I know Nathan of Sockmetician have talked warmly about those bags lots of times and I could always recommend uh, purchasing from Midwinter Yarns because they are stellar people. So, uh, but that's completely unrelated to this bag. I just like this bag. Look at that color. Look how cheerful it is. It doesn't go with the shawl in any way, but I just, I thought it was time. So, do I have more projects happening? I do. This I wasn't really gonna tell you about, but I thought I might anyway. This lives in the Little Grey Girl bag that was given to me by the Little Grey Girl, who is Gemma, who is also based in this side of London. I am working on a design, which I am going to call the Little Black Skirt. I'm telling you now, but I'm hoping you can keep up momentum and enthusiasm for me, because I'm probably not going to release it until autumn, because who's going to be wanting a woolly skirt now that summer is coming? But I'm going to be working on it anyway. Um, so, for anyone who knows me, for anyone who's met me, will know that I will always be wearing my uniform, my little black skirt. I have tons of them, uh, they all look the same. Um, they have like a one to two inch long waistband and they are kind of sort of skater dress shapes sort of maybe a bit longer than a kind of cheerleader skirt. Uh, some of them have zippers, some of them do not, but they are pretty much all yeah above the knee black flare skirts that's my uniform that's what i like to wear they seem to go well with my knitwear my shape um they're comfy and practical and i have never knitted one and i thought i would do that so, so yeah the little black skirt is happening that is the future pattern that i look forward to release um i did have a bit of an experience with the waist i thought oh i hmm, i want I don't want the skirt to be super tight, so I'm just gonna go by that measurement. Who needs negative ease in a skirt, right? So, turns out you need a lot. I would suggest five to 12 centimeters of negative ease for the skirt waist. I'm gonna put that in the pattern, obviously. I think the bigger size, the more negative ease, because you just want more ease relative to the actual measurement that you're going with, but I could be wrong, I'm gonna find out. But that's, that's what it's looking like, so. Not only is this now sitting just right, but could fall off if the skirt was heavier, I have bought elastics and there is a way you could sneak in elastics where the, the fold of the, the hem is happening. So should you think you could make it without elastics, you can always change your mind and like pop it in here later. 
yeah. So I'm just basically trying to like replicate my uniform skirt and make it into a pattern because I've never made myself a proper skirt yet. I have made dresses but no skirts so a basic black skirt is on the horizon. I am making this in Navia Duo but I think the design is going to primarily recommend DK weight yarn rather than this which is more of a sport fingering weight yarn but I, I'm gonna try to make it as versatile as possible so that it does not depend on your row gauge so if you want to you have a very dense skirt and use worsted weight yarn you can do that and still make sure that the de the increase weight is right and if you want to use sport weight or fingering weight yarn to make it very light and you don't care that it will be see-through like I don't care because I wear black tights underneath anyway then you could do that and it will still be at the right increase rate um, but i will be recommending dk weight yarns for it i'm thinking i might make a second version in soul by hillisburg because that lovely lamb soul yeah so that that's the plan but probably won't come out until autumn to be honest uh but you can look forward to it then and uh yes i will be calling it a little black skirt but you could um pretty much use any color but I will try to make instructions so that um, if you choose to work with really dark yarns, which I think a lot of people want to do for their bottom halves, uh, for a plethora of reasons I might get into, I uh, I think we want it to be easier and it can be really hard when you're folding over the hem and knitting it down. So I'm gonna, I have worked with provisional cast ons and such and it seems to be doing the trick. So um, more on that later. There is one last project that I try to start, but I'm not as optimistic about it. But I thought I'd talk about it and you can share my grievances, even though we've already done that with the, with the Polworth. So this is a little bit sad. This bag from Pink Hazel, I have been savouring since last year's Edinburgh Yarn Festival. And it's been containing, safely, amazingly, the yarn that I bought there, which was a whole sweater quantity of Black Air Yarns Jacob. Here's the yarn. I know, the colour. Shocking. Shocking, Ellie. Um, I love the yarn. I can't believe how soft they managed to get this Jacob. How did they do that? It seems largely untreated. But I worked with Jacob before and it was like knitting a rug. This is lovely. Not as lovely as a stone fine wool, mind you, but like, it's really nice. So yeah. Black Yarns Breed, Jacob, DK. I actually managed to find another two skeins in the D-stash from uh, a lovely person who's contributed to the podcast before. So those will be coming in my way so that I could make a long sleeve cardigan rather than three quarter. But I don't know if this cardigan is happening because this has been savoured in this bag with this yarn for a year. Because about a year, a year and a half ago, I went to the Carrie Westerman, um, this thing of paper book launch in Wild and Woolly. And... I fell for the cardigan that's in there. I can't pronounce things, I'll put it here. I love it, it's beautiful, it's right up my alley. Just my aesthetics, I have been wanting to make it for a long time. It was in my make nine last year, it's in my make nine this year, and I finally took the plunge and cast it on while I was learning way more than I needed to know about Ted Bundy on Netflix. So, <laughs> I got through the rape really quick, quickly, and I'm having some problems. One, and this is the main problem. The stitch definition is not good. I don't know what you think. I don't think this is very good. This terrible stitch definition with this yarn, which I don't understand, because Blacker Yarn Jacob is hardly that different from Blacker Yarn DK Classic, which is what's recommended. And in the photo, that pops, that whole cable pattern pops so nicely, yet here, this doesn't pop at all. This is sort of disappearing and melting into the background. So I don't think this is going to work out. I have just knitted up a whole ball and it's it's just not good. So that's disappointing. But I have other problems too because I have this JC Rennie DK uh, Lambswool Cashmere blend that would be amazing. It would be a nice bright red cardigan, but that is also not, not something I'm a stranger to. But there are other problems. Uh, I will never get the recommended row gauge. I know that for a fact. I know that when I knit with GK weight yarns with a 20 stitch gauge, I get about a row gauge of 30 to 28 rows per 10 centimeters or four inches. I've never gotten anything 
that requires fewer rows than that unless I'm working on something really drapey like alpaca. So I have no idea how Kerry Westerman managed to to get that um, and I don't think I will achieve that. And usually I don't fret about row gauge, I just make it work, add more rows, it'll be fine. But it's a satin sleeve design and if you get the row gauge wrong on something with a satin sleeve design that could, provo that could prove just really, really problematic because you need the arm side to have that death so that stitch count that you pick up matches that and it, I could work in more rows here but then what about the stitch count do I pick up more stitches maybe that's a good thing I've heard some people say the sleeves could be less tight so um that could work but again that's suddenly a lot more effort than I was hoping for going in here I was I am not in a modification mood with this one which leads me to the next problem that I am personally having and that is um the schematics are beautiful. I love the drawings, they're amazing. Uh, it's got lots of useful numbers there, but no information about the, the length from the underarm to the hem. Again, no problem because the pattern is so clear. You can easily just count through the rows from uh, the hem to, well, from after the hem to the underarm. It was really easy to just number them all together and divide that by the row gauge. The row gauge that I can't attain, but nonetheless, I did that and found that it's not cropped. Uh, there will be a whole 24 centimeters worked before the waist. That is very far from cropped and I wanted cropped and again I think I could just work in the decreases towards the waist now and I could get a very uh, a short cardigan that isn't cropped but it's certainly more of a resting on the hip kind of style which is exactly what I like. So that could work out. Uh, again, it's just like more modifications than I was ready for. It does mean that I can't pick up for the button band according to the pattern. Again, I can deal with that. I can work with that. I just, I'm not in a modification mood right now. And I, I really thought that cardigan was shorter than I'm now finding that it is. And it's bottom up, so uh, I kind of have to know beforehand, which makes it a lot less of a resting knit. Which it could be because the actual texture and the the cables and the fake cables are super potato chippy, as we say in the knitting world. Meaning they're simple. I can work them really easily. They are not at all difficult and they look so nice and it's just, you get so much for that fairly simple texture. So I, I really like that and I love this how it looks. I'm just... And I also love how she seems to have gotten the shoulders right. Again, these measurements are missing in the schematic, sadly, but again, not the worst to calculate. And from what I'm seeing, she does seem to have taken into account how uh, you need a lot less for the shoulder width than you do for the whole bust. A lot of the times you get designs that take the full bust measurement, they will subtract the underarm stitches and then just divide that by two and say that is the width of the shoulders. And it just doesn't look right because the shoulders will drop off and that, they're not supposed to do that for satin sleeves. So, ramble. Uh, I, I really like that this pattern does that. There was just so much calling my name for this. But when I can't get raw gauge, when my stitch definition sucks and I um, have to modify the length. Um, I don't know, guys. And I, yeah, I'm also working in the round with the stick because that, that's, that's one modification I'm always willing to do to avoid purling. <laughs> But at the end of the day, I uh, I wonder if this will get the frog. And once I frog this, will I be wanting to cast it on on a yarn that has better stitch definition? Do I have it in me? And if so, what should I do with this lovely yarn that I've been savoring for that beautiful cardigan for so long? Because I was thinking this yarn looked so similar to the blacker uh, Cornish tin, the one that I have back here on my Siri, which has amazing stitch definition and this cardigan has held up so well I can't believe Blacker hasn't made this yarn into a regular it's really sad because this has been worn so much and there isn't a single pill on this thing it is incredible so I was kind of thinking I would get that effect but I really did not and it's kind of sad so yeah welcome to the skin and its podcast where you come to be made sad about knitting projects that are not working out you, you can see why I I'd kind of lost my mojo last night. I have a sweater I've been so excited for where the, the neckline doesn't work. I have been casting on a sweater I've been so excited for where things aren't working out. 
and I'm running out of yarn for the other sweater that I've had so much mojo for earlier. <sighs> Maybe I should just cast on a pair of socks, you know? Maybe I should just keep it simple. It's, it's fine. It's fine. So that brings us to the end of all the knitting chatter and of course that is when the light is beautiful here and the sun doesn't come out in and out and bother me and change the light situation and that is when I would normally wrap things up because I have no acquisitions but I will be talking about some other things. I want to talk about size inclusivity uh, so if you're not here for that, if you're just here for knitting then uh, I will see you next time. Thank you for watching. Uh, but I'm going to go up on my soapbox a little bit and talk about size inclusivity because it's something I care a lot about but it's something I have a lot of thoughts about and more importantly it's something that I have a lot of feelings about and this is not a very well prepared speech by no means but I have a lot of feelings and you're going to have to listen to that because that is what this podcast is all about after all. <laughs> So you will no doubt have missed the very important and long overdue conversation about race and racism in the knitting community going on, primarily on Instagram, but generally I would say in the online knitting and crafting community. And that is still going. It's amazing. I am really pleased that it wasn't a fad. Uh, it's still a conversation happening. And sort of in parallel to that, a lot of other groups have made their voices heard. There's been a lot of uh, voices from the disabled community and the knitting community that have expressed a lot of how they experience things and I have sort of I guess primarily <laughs> amplified other people's voices and less so talked about uh, where I'm coming from which is being uh, a person who has been of many different sizes throughout my life. I have Basically, in terms of kilos, my weight has been three digits. Um, it, it's been a thing that's been a case for the majority of my life. I have been at a low weight in my 20s. It's something that I think not many people would guess if they just met me as an adult, but it's been uh, a theme throughout my life. I could not find clothes in the children's department. I have to be... Since I was a single digit age, I had to go shopping in the adult department. It, it's not, it's not happy memories and it, there's a lot of feelings. And so now I am seeing a lot of people trying to be size inclusive in their patterns. A lot of fellow designers who wants to tick off that box. And I am feeling a lot of things about that. First of all, that's great. If we get more sizes, amazing, cool, yay. But I find it a little bit patronizing or matronizing, whatever word you want to use, a bit condescending. Because here's the thing, the people in my life who made me feel bad about my body, who still make me feel bad about my body, are non-fat people. Uh, so whilst I don't like blame every non-fat person in the world for those feelings that I have had and still have, I I find it kind of hard. I, I guess I become a bit distrusting when all of a sudden people just suddenly appear to care. And I'm like, I really hope people do care, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Because like I, and I went over this whole, you know, rant on Instagram earlier this week as well. Uh, I myself, I get tagged as a, a size inclusive designer a lot of the time. It is something that I think is really awesome. I am very honored to be included there, um, being considered as size inclusive. But I have to say honestly, I never tried to be size inclusive in terms of like that as a, as a buzzword, as a thing that you're supposed to like fall under that label, I just thought when I was making my first designs, oh my, wh what if someone finds my design and they want to make it and they can't find their size? That would be terrible. I would be a terrible designer if that happened. I would, I would, you know, it was, I saw that as a failure on me as a designer. I saw that as I have not done my job if they can't find their size in there. And I, I still look at it that way, I still think of it in that term. That my job as a designer, not only is it my job to make something that you want to make, something with the aesthetic that suits you, that you want, that speaks to you, 
to do the numbers, the grading and the maths, but also it's my job to make sure that it fits you. Like I say that a bit relatively and I will get back to that later. We're all different and I can only do so much. The least I can do is try to grade for the available sites out there. And I guess I just want people to think of it in that way. You don't just go, oh yeah, gotta be size inclusive too. Gotta be so inclusive. Gotta be very accessible. Take off, take off. You know, and instead just think, just feel that feeling, that feeling of responsibility of what happens when you do not include, and that you don't want to be that. I, I guess I'm finding it really hard to put in the words. I just want people to think what newbie designer Ellie was thinking, which is, wouldn't it be horrible if someone couldn't find their size? <laughs> you know? Uh, I think that is where true, not to like toot my own horn and say that I get everything right, I don't. But it's kind of like coming from a real place of caring. So yeah, I just want to kind of address all those designers, all those indie designers out there who are now thinking of expanding their size range. Um, I guess the outcome is the same either way, whether you really care or not, because uh, we get more sizes and that's always amazing. But really, I care about your intentions. I really care about intentions, whether the outcome is the same either way, I care that you care. I want you to mean it when you include more sizes. I want you to mean it. I want you to care about us. I want you to want us to find sizes that fit us. So that that's kind of what my main mantra was there, my main little soapbox speech. But also I have a couple of things to add to that. A couple of advice, like, cause I, it's so easy to point fingers and say, oh, don't do this and don't do that. And this isn't right. And this is, I like to give people something to work on, something that could actually help. So. I thought I'd go through five things you can do as an indie designer. Again, I think I'm gonna put this up on Instagram as well. I haven't done that yet, but I, I probably will because people see that they're not necessarily here because I seem to have a lot more followers there all of a sudden. It used to be proportionate, but eh, I'm still here. So one thing you can do as a designer, first of all, is caring. And I keep emphasizing this because I really want you to care. I want you to have a deep desire to include people of all sizes. I want you to recognize your internalized fat phobia. And I know that sounds really harsh. I'm like, are you calling me fat phobic? I have fat friends. Like, yeah, here's the thing, right? We're in a culture that is fat phobic. And if we're in a culture that's fat phobic, that means we have internalized that. It doesn't mean that we are uh, explicitly fat phobic. It just means that we, we live and we breathe culture. So if our culture is that way, then there is some part of our subconscious that is that way too. And I don't want you to be ashamed of that and to ignore that. And I certainly do not want you to suppress that. Because if there's anything I know from being a psychology PhD student who lectures in prejudice and discrimination is that stereotype suppression only makes things worse. Because what it does is that you manage to use mental effort to suppress stereotypes. And then they come out tenfold once you run out of that mental energy. I mean energy, not like, whoa, but like, effort so if you want to look that up go on google scholar and type in stereotype suppression and that's very interesting so i can recommend that so that's what i mean when i say recognize your internal fat phobia you can apply that to other domains too it's just to see how real it is this, this is like my approach to all all the isms that I stand for this is my approach to say i'm just gonna use an obvious one feminism the way I've come to that position is that I look within myself when I see just all the internalized misogyny that I have, all the times that I think something negative about a certain type of woman and I realize that is wrong, that's not right. Um, I think that self-examination is once you're gentle with yourself and not, <sighs> yeah, having that real talk with yourself, being introspective and I think it's just a really productive way of discovering your culture is to actually look internally because we're all part of culture. That's kind of what culture com is composed of. So yeah. Uh, next point, use size inclusive sizing standards. This is an actual advice for how to actually grade for other sizes. Um, there's the Craft Yarn Council. 
they're not perfect but that's a start it's free there they have spreadsheets on their website um again take it with a grain of salt but it is there they give a broad range of bust measurements and sizes that go along with that uh, that's a start where that could help you to grade beyond your current size range Isolde Teague also has a, a size spreadsheet. It's on her blog, so you may just want to Google Isolde Teague um, size spreadsheet or something. Because um, having looked at this a bit and having talked to other people who are quite interested in this, I talked to Alex of uh, Spindles and Stitches. I hope I didn't get that in the wrong order. Uh, and she ha did a poll and found that most people... Um, say that basically the reason they don't grade for larger sizes is that they don't feel like they're competent enough to do so and I think yeah but you gotta learn then like I I am self-taught I have just slightly above average math skills and I've been teaching myself how to grade just for the past year or so and it doesn't really take more than that I don't think I'm an expert yet there's probably still stuff I've yet to learn but really it's a poor excuse at the end of the day it's not impossible it's far from that it's not like bigger bodies are somehow alien where suddenly sizes play by completely different rules keep grading you know like the numbers are there if you look at these spreadsheets the numbers are there you know how much easy you want in the pattern so just do the maths you know you as an indie designer you should really know how to do you know stitches and rows by a row gauge and stitch gauge uh, so but a note of caution please 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 do not grade the neckline in proportion to the bust size People with bigger busts do not have bigger heads. It's not like we need like necklines this wide. Sorry, you didn't need to see my bra strap. But this happens a lot, especially with York designs. I see that they just have massive neck, neck openings because people just think that their neck opening should be 40% of the bust measurement. And I'm just... Yeah, no. So uh, just be aware of that. Same thing with like drop sleeve shoulders remember that shoulder drops in proportion to how much of the bust measurement so it will drop more for larger sizes you do not need to grade those sleeves to be longer for those sizes trust me the drop shoulder is going to be doing the grading for you so like there's a lot of like pitfalls you could fall into and honestly if you're an indie designer you we have the responsibility to educate ourselves on that to cater to all bodies uh it, it's hard there's a infinite amount of bodies out there and uh, just expanding your size range is a great start my other request for you is to ditch the sizing labels seriously just let go of the whole s m l xl and so on just don't and reject any like publication who tells you to use them as well just say no i don't do that why because it's not nice when you have a size range of maybe 15 sizes to be told that you are 8XL. Not because that's a bad thing, but when you look into the, the fat phobia in our culture and you put that together with like the heaviness of being labeled as extra large times 8, I think that's that can be quite difficult for a lot of people. Um, it, I think it's a lot better to just give your sizes arbitrary numbers. Size them from 1, 2, 3, 4, up to maybe say 15. That's usually what I do. 15 is a lot of sizes. That's just because I like to differentiate them by just 2 inches each. But that is my decision. Because I also think people should be able to find um, this stuff that fits their measurements. Even if they are within the, the more normal range in terms of like you know the bell curve. But hey, maybe you don't want to number your uh, sizes. Maybe you think telling someone that there are um, number 15 out of 15, uh, number one out of one uh, is maybe not the best thing either. Like people have different feelings about these things. There's a lot of feelings. And so maybe you want to use letters. You can letter them from size A, B, C, D. Like that's another way of doing it. Or you could simply refer to the sizes as the most relevant measure, such as the bust measurements. You could say, oh, that's the 42 inch bust and that's the 44 inch bust and that's the 48. You, you get where I'm going with this. So I really want to discourage the whole lettering the the whole s m xl thing because if you are like me and you want to use a more fine grained kind of uh, sizing then okay so say you have um an 
90 centimeter boss and you call that a medium and then you have 95 is that then large is that mean 100 centimeters the extra large see it doesn't make sense you have to like start m m2 l l2 l3 just no and also i think it would greatly reduce your pattern support questions because you're not going to get as many emails going well, I made size M. I am always a size M, but that didn't fit me. So why didn't it fit bad pattern? And it's like, well, you should have measured yourself. And <laughs> so it really, these arbitrary sizing names really encourages people to actually get the measuring tapes out before they cast on. So it, it, it really benefits all. And second to last advice is to give suggestions in your pattern for where you could make modifications. Because again, there are a plethora of bodies out there, it's so different and you can't possibly know all the different ways a body can be different. You can't possibly assist with all the possible pattern modifications out there. I get a lot of pattern modifications emails and it's just not something I have capacity for and quite frankly having paid about five, six pounds for a pattern doesn't really cover the cost of me sitting down and reworking the pattern for a particular modification so what i do use instead is some pin pointers in the pattern for where length can be adjusted for i think that's really helpful i'm seeing a trend nowadays that i don't really like which is given it just gives a number of rows they never say knit to x uh, measurements inches centimeters because if you get row gauge it should be accurate but who gets row gauge really so my hang up with this system is not just because it relies on accurate row gauge but because which limits you know your possibilities of yarn substitutions but because it's really hard to know where you can add length you keep going by number of rows it says to decrease every sixth row so okay if i want to add length where do i add the length do i can i decrease every eighth row it starts to look very complicated and maybe that's the most obvious answer but it's diff different from different patterns so I would say give a little advice, you know, and just like a bit of italics on the side to say this is where you could modify for length. It does so much different because here's the thing, sizing standards are all well and nice, but they tend to assume that the bigger you are, the taller you are, uh, that because you have a bigger bust measurement, you should have longer sleeves because it, it just makes no sense. So I think that could be really helpful. I also think it would be great to get some advice for how you could change the measurements like say if you have a cardigan with the shoulder bust waist hip measurement and it assumes that everyone fits the sizing standards it's kind of like your usual bell curve and maybe you're not like like speaking as someone who has like a, a five inch difference between their bust and their hip it would be super helpful with some advice as to how I could maybe go transition to a different size as I go to different parts in the body. Again, this gets very advanced, so you could say that. There's no advanced advice for how you could do that if you want to have a go. You're on your own, but again, it's a lot of extra words to put into a pattern and I can see why people don't do this, but it's something I think a lot of us would appreciate. And the fifth and final advice, which might be the most uh, potentially controversial one here, and that is if you are an independent designer who self-publishes a pattern on sites such as Ravelry, model your own stuff. Just do that. Like, all designers are different. Like, sure, there is not enough diversity in there, and there's been a lot of conversations about that in the racism discussion. And I think, you know, th there's work to be done there, just to add a note about that. But designers are still very different in terms of their body and I'm mainly just focusing on size inclusivity here but really this goes beyond that because really some of us are fat and some of us are thin and some are tall and some are short and some are disabled and some have mobility aids and some of us are pregnant. I, I, I'm not pregnant. And yeah some of us are old and some of us are young and some of us have just yeah different bodies in all the different ways a body can be different and I think if people model their own stuff you're already doing a lot of the work if you are working on kind of that level because not all of us are at the level where we hire models but it's great if you want to hire uh, a different bodied model again I am mainly focusing on size here but these things do apply to other things as well uh, but say you want to hire a fat model great cool 
I'm just saying you don't have to. I'm not going to be angry if you are a slim designer who wants to model stuff yourself. Cool. But if you want to hire a fat model, cool. But also, maybe not just hire us for when you want to sell a pattern under the label size inclusive or something. You know, we can model accessories too. We can model other things. We we do a pretty good job of modeling shawls and socks and you know, it's don't just use us when you're trying to make money off being size inclusive because this is getting back to what I said earlier. I really want you to care. So, that was me on my massive size inclusive soapbox, pun intended, and I hope this gave some food for thought. I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions on this. If you are different bodies, if you are a fat person, if you are not, I am. Um, I I don't tend to bite people's heads off for not saying um, using the right words or whatever. Uh, as long as you are willing to listen to me going, ah, maybe you shouldn't say that. But you know, appreciate the the intent. Uh, I, I, that's kind of my my gig. But maybe. I will get fed up with that and become like a, a mantis who just goes, <laughs> who knows? So yeah, thank you all so much for watching. I'm gonna go to a concert today and have so much fun and on so much less sleep than I should have had because I thought I would have a line today, but they started boring into the like ground outside and like that was eight in the morning. I mean, I know it's a weekday, but come on. So yeah, that is what's happening here today. I need to clear up my whole podcasting setup and uh, get out the door. So yeah, as ever, thank you all so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.